Okay, so I, I think we're going to record this, right? It's, yep, it's being, being recorded. Being recorded. Excellent. Yep. All right. So I'm pleased to welcome Nate Brown to our uh, virtual Crimson Clover. He was trying to schedule a, a work vacation kind of thing where you come out with his family and spend a few days. But um, anyway, we're, we're, we're super glad Nate that you were able to organize it um, anyway virtually. So Nate is a theoretical, theoretical mathematician uh, committed to equity and inclusion in STEM education. I guess. How many years has it been since you turned your interest to educational research? Maybe five or ten? Five, five, five six. Till it was genuine. I'll, yeah, about that. One of, one of the, the things that he works with or runs the STEM diversity lab at Penn State, and his lab is currently developing a, a valid and reliable measure of, of inclusive instructor behaviors in undergraduate math classes. And interestingly, we're going to be using those items in a research work we're doing this semester at San Diego State. And Colin McCraney is on the, the call now. He's working to incorporate those items into, into a survey he's developing for our pre-calculus and calculus courses. So we're looking forward to continuing to work with, with Nate. Um, I, I first read about some of Nate's work in this large uh, procedure of uh, academy study where they, they looked at that um, how STEM courses disproportionately weed out underrepresented students. Um, they've also looked at the differential impacts of COVID pandemic on race by race, ethnicity, sex, and socioeconomic status, and um, among other things. And I'll just turn it over to Nate and let him share some of the great things he's doing. Oh, wait, I just spotlighted a late. There we go. There you go. Spotlight Nate. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Good no worries. There we go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's a real honor to be here virtually. Uh, so thank you for having me. But I have to say it's also a little scary to be here because I'm I'm not an expert in education, at least not yet. Um, I'm working on it, but there's a lot to learn. Uh, and my expertise is in theoretical mathematics, C-star algebras, von Neumann algebras, uh, non-commuted probability. I spent 20 years publishing uh, theorems in these areas. But as Chris said, now my research focuses entirely on equity in STEM education, or rather in equity in STEM education. Um, and, you know, I've, I've always loved teaching and I've taken it very seriously. But to understand this new line of research and really, I think, why I'm so passionate about it, uh, I hope it'd be helpful if I sort of help you understand what led to the change. Um, because it took many years and it involves some pretty humbling experiences. Uh, so if you'll if you'll stay with me for a bit, I'd like to spend a few minutes um, telling you how I got here. So maybe the story begins in 2010. Um, I was on sabbatical and the institution I was visiting, they needed someone to teach a math class for their elementary ed majors. So you know the undergrads who go on to become uh, teachers at our elementary schools. Now, I was used to teaching math majors, graduate students, so this seemed like an interesting change of pace. Plus, plus, both of my daughters at the time were in kindergarten, so I was pretty excited to teach math to their future teachers, right? So I happily accept the gig, and uh, you know, I start to learn about this institution's math for elementary ed course, um, and well, it... <laughs> It turns out the course was, shall we say, unique. Uh, it had been developed by one of their theoretical research mathematicians who completely rewrote the curriculum according to what he believed future elementary school teachers should know. Now, this man was 100% invested in the course. It was his baby. He literally wrote the book uh, that was used at that institution. Um, and he had the best intentions. He was a wonderfully kind man who cared deeply about students and mathematics and math education, but there's really no nice way to say it. It was the worst course I've ever seen. It literally started with group theory, though he didn't use those words, but that's what he was teaching these elementary, uh, elementary ed majors. And if you're wondering what group theory is, you are not alone. Um, unless you we were a math major, because this is material that undergrad math majors typically see in their third year. Very few non-math majors ever see group theory. 
And he genuinely believed future elementary school teachers should know this. I mean, this is like introducing organic chemistry or quantum mechanics in a course for elementary ed majors. I was just stunned. But I was also on sabbatical and I didn't want to develop my own curriculum. So I used his book and I did my best and it didn't go well. Students did their best too. Um, but, you know, they weren't prepared for group theory any more than they'd be prepared for quantum mechanics. And they really couldn't understand why on earth they were forced to learn this stuff. Those poor students, they wore their suffering on their sleeve. The pain was palpable. Like I literally could see it in their faces. And remember, these were my daughter's future teachers, and I was responsible for that palpable pain that I was witnessing. So that wasn't too fun, um, but something else happened in 2010 that would have a huge impact on me eventually. Um, a remarkable paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, researchers were studying math anxiety in an elementary school context. And they wondered what happens if a first or second grade teacher has high math anxiety. Specifically, they wondered if a teacher's math anxiety would be reflected in the student's math achievement, right? That was the research question. Does a teacher's anxiety impact student's achievement? Well, as you might guess, the answer is yes. But it's not uniformly yes, right? It's not uniform across the classes. When the teachers in this study had math, had, had high math anxiety, the little boys in their classes weren't significantly impacted, which among other things means the teachers were doing a great job teaching the math. It was getting through to the boys despite their anxiety. It was only the little girls who showed decreased math achievement, which means that the boys and the girls in those classes were not having identical experiences, even though they're literally in the same class. And the researchers uh, suggested that this wasn't the, they weren't able to test this in their study, but they suggested based on other research um, that one explanation might be because uh, you know, in first and second grade, almost all teachers are women, and research shows that children are more likely to emulate the behaviors and attitudes of same-gender adults. Girls tend to emulate women, boys tend to emulate men. So put another way, when an elementary school teacher has high math anxiety, it's more likely to be picked up on and internalized by their students of the same gender. And that's why the math achievement of the little girls suffered while the little boys didn't. So let me summarize, right? It's 2010, I'm on sabbatical, essentially torturing future elementary school teachers with group theory. And I learn that any trauma I cause in that class is likely to be passed on to our daughters, but not our sons. Well, I wish I could tell you that that was the pivotal moment and I committed right then and there to learning everything I could about education, teaching equity, right? Become the very best teacher I could possibly be. But that's not exactly what happened. Um, what happened was I tucked those uncomfortable thoughts into the back of my brain and I continued proving and publishing theorems about C-star algebras. Because let's be honest, um, Math research is the only thing that really matters to a math department at a large research institution like Penn State or I assume San Diego State, right? There's no incentive for me to go out and learn to do something better. Um, so I, I wish I could tell you I handled it differently, but the truth is I put those things in the back of my brain and I just kept doing the things that Penn State rewards me for. But of course, tucking uncomfortable things into the back of your brain, it, it doesn't eliminate the discomfort. It just sort of sits there and festers and grows, right? And over the years, these uncomfortable thoughts, they'd occasionally reemerge. So I did start to learn a little bit about better teaching, active learning techniques. I started to experiment. Um, I gradually moved away from traditional lecture and did some more in-class group work. Um, 
one of the first things I, I really started to do was try to be intentional about sending growth mindset messages, building confidence in students. Um, but still, I was more or less, you know, teaching very similar to the way I always had done. And I, I wasn't learning about education research, equity research, and so on. But then in 2016, another study came out, stunning paper. This was actually co authored uh, by your own Chris Rasmussen, by the way. Um, and this time I couldn't just tuck these findings into the back of my brain. You see, the 2010 study, this only applied to me because I was teaching elementary ed majors at that moment, right? I haven't taught that class since. So it was easy enough to sort of push those results to the back of my brain because they didn't apply directly to me. And it's easy to be apathetic, right? When injustice doesn't touch our life directly. But the 2016 study, that was about college calculus, something I teach every year. And Chris and, and co-authors, um, what they found was that women are 1.5 times more likely than men to leave a STEM major after taking college calculus. Engineering, chemistry, biology, all these disciplines lose more women than men after calculus, the, the course I teach. And this just scared the hell out of me because I can't live with myself if I'm contributing to gender inequity in STEM education. I can't look myself in the mirror and say, you know, but I'm a good teacher and I love my students. I have the best intentions. I want all my students to succeed. I mean, those things are all true, but my best intentions, or my genuine love of my students does not matter. It's completely irrelevant to students who are being harmed in my classroom. I mean, I, I think of it as sort of like the difference between accidental manslaughter and premeditated murder. I mean, this is an extreme analogy, but I hope the point will come through, right? Manslaughter and murder are not the same thing. The intent is totally different. But to the dead person, manslaughter and murder, they're the same. And that's sort of how I see equity in STEM education. It doesn't matter what I think about education or whether I love teaching and have the very best intentions. To my students, the thing that matters is how they experience my class. It's not about me, it's about them. And this simple act of decentering changes everything. So it's 2016, and I finally faced a very uncomfortable truth. Right? I've always been a passionate, caring, committed teacher who knows a lot about research, theoretical math research, and almost nothing about equity in education. And it really bothered me that that ignorance may very well make my classroom a source of inequity. So I decided to transition from math research to equity in education research. And it has been incredibly hard, um, incredibly humbling, and incredibly meaningful. You know, I, I wish I'd made this transition sooner. Um, but all I can do now is commit the remainder of my career to dismantling the structural sexism, racism that pervades higher STEM education. Um, and of course, I, I'm, many of our colleagues have been at this for a long time. I'm definitely late to this party, uh, but I hope everyone doing education research, if you're not already at the party, please come join us. It's a great party. It's a lot of fun. Um, so that brings us to the research part of my talk. Um, so let me share my screen real quick and we'll pull up some PowerPoint slides. Uh, is those, are those coming through? All right, beautiful. So yes, as, as Chris mentioned, I'm, I'm here to talk about our current project, which is inclusive instructor behaviors. Um, but I want to provide a little more context uh, to this project. So I'd like to start with uh, the paper that Chris mentioned. It's it's absolutely um, inspired by the 2016 paper. We were really trying to uh, sort of replicate and extend that work from an intersectional uh, perspective. And so let me let me set up that that paper that we we published last fall. So consider the following. 
imagine you have two first year college students. They show up to San Diego State University, bright eyed and ready to further their education. These two students have identical GPA, high school GPA and ACT. And in case you're wondering why we chose those particular numbers for our hypothetical students, it's because both of our students declare a STEM major when they come into college. And those, that, that GPA and, and that ACT, uh, those are the averages of the STEM majors in the data set we are using. So you're really looking at prototypical incoming STEM students. All right. Well, in addition, um, and their first semester STEM courses, you know, the sort of weed out courses, math, chemistry, intro bio, whatever. Um, these two hypothetical students get Caesar better in all of them. So they survive their first semester weed out courses. And the question we wondered was what's the chance that, you know, four, five, six years down the road, these students actually get a STEM degree? And the answer, if you're a white male, is 48%. And if you're a black female, the answer is 28%. And this is to me just a shocking and horrifying disparity. Um, not entirely surprised, and I confess I was surprised by the magnitude of the disparity. Um, I really was hoping it wouldn't be that big, but that's that's what we found in our in our data. So this work is based on um, a midfield data set. It's got we we used one hundred and ten thousand students. Uh, we have actual transcripts, complete transcripts for all of these students. They all come from large public research intensive universities, places you know like Penn State. Um, and so these are, you know, the kids I'm seeing, the kids you guys are seeing every single fall. And these disparities, as I say, are are well, for me, they're just horrific. And so we have to do something about this. We can't we can't unring this bell. Like we know how bad it is. We have to do something. Um, and no doubt there's going to be a lot of things that are contributing to this disparity. Um, it's not going to be, you know, a one dimensional problem. There's going to have many dimensions to the disparity of this, of this type, but we have to be real careful when we start to try to figure out what's going on. We cannot blame uh, K-12 preparation because the students in our in our profile had identical high school GPA and ACT scores. We cannot blame this disparity on, you know, differences in interest in STEM between men and women or, or whatever. We can't blame because they were all came in with a STEM, uh, declaring a STEM degree. And we can't blame first semester grades because they both survived all of their intro uh, weed out courses, STEM, STEM courses. And this leads me to a very uncomfortable conclusion, right? Because if we were in an equitable higher STEM education ecosystem, right? If it was genuinely a, a sort of level playing field in college, then when two students come to you and they have the same high school preparation, interest in STEM grades in their first semester, we would expect that they have similar probabilities of graduate and they don't, which means that we can't be in an equitable system. So my only conclusion from this is that the, the ecosystem in which we are all operating right now is contributing to the structural sexism and racism uh, that has been so well documented in other contexts of our, our society. So I um, want to know what we can do about that. We faculty, right? How can we start to critically analyze, dismantle uh, these structures, these structural inequities. Um, and that's what my whole project is about, inclusive instructor behaviors. But I, before I get to that, I want to present one more study um, that quite clearly shows one of, the, one of the ways that faculty are contributing to structural inequities. And this was a, a very impactful study for me personally. Um, and so this one is focusing on faculty. How can how are faculty contributing? What are what are some of the many ways that we might be contributing? And this has to do with the beliefs of faculty. So I'm just going to recall for you the definitions of fixed and growth mindset because we're thinking of, of faculty now. What do faculty believe? Um, 
And a lot of faculty, especially in math, actually math and physics, tend, I'm sorry, math and philosophy, tend to have the highest uh, percentages of, of faculty with this fixed mindset. Um, anyway, the fixed mindset is a belief, a worldview that talents and abilities, whether it's intelligence, whatever that means, um, these things are mostly fixed. They're sort of imprinted in your DNA at birth. Uh, there's not a lot you can do to change your, your talents and abilities. And if you hold this mindset, then failure, it just reflects a lack of an aid, but you just don't have it. Now, the reason you failed, you probably just don't have what it takes. That's the way someone with a strong fixed mindset uh, may view things. But that's not the only way uh, to think. It's not the only belief that you can have about talents and abilities. A growth mindset would, would see this as uh, a case where most abilities can be acquired with enough effort and training. And here I have to be quick to point out most, right? Growth mindset does not suggest that everybody can become a professional basketball player. Um, that's not a typical ability. But I personally would put something like calculus in the most abilities category. I, I will never, ever believe that calculus is more difficult to learn than a language. And we all learn a language. It takes a long time. It's not quick. Uh, but I personally do put calculus into the most abilities category. And I genuinely do believe that that can be acquired with enough effort and training. Um, but we don't really do that. We don't really offer enough time and training to learn those things. Uh, but anyway, when you take this worldview, then uh, failure just means that we need to practice more. It's not a statement about your DNA. It's a statement about your training and that we can do something about. Okay, so the question that is addressed in the study that I'm about to present, right, is whether an instructor's mindset is reflected in student grades. Um, it's sort of similar to the math anxiety study that I mentioned at the beginning, the 2010 study. Um, but this time we're looking at STEM instructors. We're looking at higher ed, not elementary school. Um, and what they found, um, well, so sorry, let me give you some statistics here. So in this study, they were looking at about 15,000 students, students' grades in STEM courses. This came from about 150 faculty instructors, STEM instructors in college. And so they took the instructors, these 150, and they sort of categorized them as a strong fixed mindset, strong growth mindset. And then they looked at the grades that the students in their those instructors' classes got. And they find that, that the, the grades of their students are reflected um, in the two different mindsets of the instructor. Um, but it's most pronounced when you look at underrepresented students, so Black, Hispanic, or Native and Indigenous students. When the instructor holds a strong fixed mindset, a typical URM student got a B minus in their class. And when the instructor has a growth mindset, a typical URM student got a B. So this to me is uh, a very disturbing um, but important um, study that shows one of the many ways that faculty may be contributing to um, structural inequities. And again, uh, this really hits home for math, because in mathematics, uh, us and the philosophers apparently are where we find the highest percentages of faculty that hold a fixed, strong fixed uh, mindset. Okay, so what are other ways? that faculty may be contributing. And that really is the subject of the work that I'm, I'm doing right now. Um, I am most interested right now in looking at how faculty might impact some psychosocial variables. Specifically, uh, I am looking at two student level psychosocial variables, sense of belonging amongst our students. So, how do our students feel, right? Are they feeling secure? Do they feel supported? Uh, is there a sense of acceptance and inclusion identity when they're in a STEM context? And the other is self-efficacy. Um, and here I have to probably say from the beginning, I'm still not entirely sure what the difference between self-efficacy and confidence is. So I've been told those aren't synonymous, um, but I very well may interchange them in this talk, because as I say, I'm still not entirely sure what the difference is. In any case, 
self-efficacy is belief in one's capacity to be successful in STEM. And as I say, what I'm really trying to study right now is how we faculty might be impacting students, sense of belonging students, uh, belief in their capacity to be successful. So why am I focusing on these two variables? Uh, well, a few years back, it's, I don't know, been five or six years now, the National Academy of Sciences um, released this report that I show there. And one of the many things they do in that, um, in that report, they review the literature that shows that both belonging and self-efficacy are quite malleable. And let me just give you a quick example to illustrate this. Um, and there really is research behind it, but I don't think we need to see it to believe it. Um, let's think about belonging for a second. And imagine you go to a party and imagine you don't know anybody at the party, but you've been invited and so you show up and you open the door and there's a bunch of people, they're all talking, they're having conversations, right? They see you walk in, they stop their conversation, they look at you, and then they go back to their conversation. Nobody even acknowledges you, right? How's your belonging at that party? How are you going to feel? Are you going to feel welcome? As opposed to you go to the same party, right? You open up the door, somebody looks at you, somebody walks over like, oh, hi, how are you? Who are you? You know, can, where can I take your coat? There's the snacks, there's the drinks. We're very glad you could, right? Belonging is a very, very malleable uh, variable. And the point here, from my perspective, is that if we have malleable variables, student level malleable variables, then as instructors, we have the capacity to increase or decrease, you know, to sort of turn the dial on those variables. And so these are uh, places that, that I'm very interested in studying. The other reason, though, or one of the other reasons that I'm so interested in these two is that both belonging and uh, self-efficacy are associated with student outcomes, grades, persistence, uh, et cetera. And so to me, when I think about what an instructor can do to increase or decrease uh, student success, when we think about variables that we can turn the dials on that are malleable and which are associated with student outcomes, those are prime places for intervention, right? Those are prime places where we instructors uh, can hopefully increase uh, the variables in a way that is reflected in student success, however you choose to measure that. And here, um, I just wanna give a shout out to this little resource. I've been to this webpage so many times I've lost track. Um, anyway, this is a great resource for things around mindset and belonging. Their little tab on research and resources is wonderful. It has a, a long list of the actual research papers, even some syntheses. So I'm just advertising this, this wonderful website um, if you haven't already been there. Okay, well, so I talked about malleability and association with student outcomes, but there's actually another reason that I'm really focused on uh, belonging and self-efficacy. And that's just pragmatic. It's just a pragmatic reason because I'm sure um, if any of you or those of you who have been involved, you know, in trying to talk to people about better teaching, how to become a better teacher, how to, you know, increase whatever uh, dimension of, of education you're interested in, Oftentimes what you hear is, yeah, but it's just so much work to learn an active learning technique or to learn mastery grade, what, right? It's so much, and that really would have resonated with me uh, even just 10 years ago. So another reason that I'm so interested in these two variables is that you can go in tomorrow into your class and start to promote belonging and self-efficacy without changing a single thing in your class. You don't have to change a thing. You could walk in tomorrow and start to say things like, y'all belong here. Y'all belong here because you have done what you're supposed to do in high school. You did what was asked. You learned what you're supposed to do. And you have the capacity to be successful in this course. And then you can give them the same exam that you wrote the day before or whatever, right? These messages don't require any other changes. Now, I certainly hope we won't stop there. But as I say, this is a pragmatic reason. Um, that I'm sort of really focused on these variables because there are things you can do and they can be impactful without changing anything else uh, in your course. 
I will say here uh, anecdotally from, from my students and others, it is super important that if you decide to do this, if you decide to send some of these messages to your class, that it be authentic. Students are very tuned in to, to BS. And they'll, they've, they've told me this, right? Um, in our focus groups, actually, this came up. If you are saying things and you don't really believe them, they will pick up on it. Um, so anyway, if you choose to do this, please make sure you are being authentic and also you need to repeat it often. Um, it's not the sort of thing you can just go in on the first day of class, make this claim, and then believe that everybody's belonging and self-efficacy has been impacted. Um, that's just not how humans work. In any case, here's a, a very light lift that we can all uh, start to do. And I do want to illustrate for you before we get into the, the deep dive in the research, just how impactful this can be. Um, about two weeks ago, I got an email message from a former student. Um, her name is Taylor. Taylor wrote me and she said, just found this. Your original note faded a bit, but I rewrote it. Just thought you'd appreciate knowing I've held on to this for encouragement for 10 years. And I didn't know what she was talking about. That was the entire message. But there was an attachment. And so I click on the attachment. And what comes up is a pic of an exam that she had taken 10 years earlier in my class. And I had handwritten a little note at the bottom of her exam. Um, and what she's referring to here, the, the ink that I used had faded, so you couldn't really read it. But in big, bold, you know, black uh, ink, she had rewritten uh, the note that I left on the bottom of her exam. And this is what I wrote. There's a reason you're in this program. You're smart. And when doubt fills your head, remember how far you've come and remember that I believe in you. That cost me nothing to write that. I didn't have to change a thing in my class. Uh, and it was incredibly touching to get this feedback 10 years later. And again, this is just to illustrate how impactful it can be to, to do some of these messagings. Um, because, you know, I've, I've interacted with a lot of students and get feedback from them. And I've never once had a student write me five years after the fact and be like, you know, that think, pair, share thing. Man, that was really impactful <laughs> that, you know, the group work that you did, like, I've never gotten those messages, but I do get messages like the Taylor's not the only one. Um, so anyway, I think these variables are really important for us to think about for their malleability, for their associations, and for their potential impact and the light lift that it can require to, to send positive messages um, to our students. Okay, so what are we doing more specifically? What we are doing now, we're trying to develop a measure of inclusive instructor behaviors where inclusive is operationalized as promoting belonging and self-efficacy. Um, we have taken a grounded approach. Uh, there, is no, there is no measure out there that I'm aware of uh, that gets at these things. And so we we took a grounded approach. And so just sort of roughly, you know, when you're developing a new measure and you take a grounded approach, the first step is going to be to go ask your students, do some focus groups, interviews, whatever, um, and ask your students, what does your math instructor do or say that makes you feel you belong and can succeed? And then you take everything that you hear from all the students, all the behaviors, you know, they're kind, they're patient, they're, they're not patient, whatever they say. Uh, and you put them all into a survey. And then you distribute it out to a bunch of students to have them fill out this survey. My instructor does this, doesn't do that on Likert scale or whatever. Um, do exploratory factor analyses, item reduction. And then the final step is to um, take the reduced instrument, the one that you believe is the right one after exploratory factor analyses and item reduction, collect more data do confirmatory factor analyses and validity studies. Uh, we are basically finished with steps one and two. Uh, we're still writing up step two, but, but that part is done. Um, and we're actually in the process um, of collecting data for step three. And, and as Chris, I'm super grateful for the help we're getting uh, from Chris and Colin to help collect data for the confirmatory factor analysis that we hope to do soon. 
So I want to unpack a little bit our methodology here because, you know, as I hope my, my story at the beginning suggests or makes very clear, I'm not coming into this from an education perspective so much as from an equity perspective, right? I, I am very motivated by, by social justice and inequity. And so my methodology reflects that. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. So I didn't really know this word at the time, quant crit, or this concept, um, but the people I was working with did, and my, my mentors, and so they, they didn't try to throw everything at me at the same time, but the methodology that we used apparently falls under this umbrella. Um, so quant crit, as I understand it, and I am still, still learning a lot of things here, it's essentially asking hard questions, critical questions questions about quantitative methods from a social justice perspective, whether it's you know critical race theory, feminist or intersectional perspective, whatever the, the case may be, it's asking hard questions about quote unquote objective quantitative methods. So we are developing a measure. And so let's think about some of the questions that you might ask, the critical hard questions about classical quantitative methods that might be introducing bias, that might be uh, exacerbating inequities. So one question you might ask is this, right? We took a grounded approach. So our very first step was to do focus groups, ask students, what does your instructor do or say? Um, well, you know, if you just did this randomly, if you went to a random calculus class and you took a random sample of the students, who's gonna show up to your focus groups? Well, it depends entirely on your institution, right? If you're at an HBCU and you go to a calculus class and you take a random, like everybody that shows up at the focus group is probably gonna be African-American. If you do it at Penn State, it's very likely there will be zero. African Americans that show up to your focus groups. In fact, if you do it at a place like Penn State randomly, right, it's very likely that 75% of your focus group participants are going to be white and Asian men, because that's what a random sample could easily look like at a place like Penn State. So, what would be the consequences if you were to do that, right? Whose voices would dominate these data when you start to ask, what does your instructor do that makes you feel you belong, makes you feel you can succeed? If 75% of your focus group is white and Asian men, then those are the voices that are going to dominate those data. And then when you do the, the first step, right, you take all the things that the students say, you slap them into a big survey. Those are going to be the voices that dominate the items uh, in, in that first step and, and everything after that. And the question is, could this exacerbate inequity? Because, you know, that 2010 study shows very clearly that the little boys and little girls in the elementary school study, right, they were in the same class, but they weren't experiencing it the same way. They weren't. They were having very different experiences. And so if you're doing focus groups and 75% are white and Asian, those are dominating the data, right, what you're really going to be capturing here primarily are the things that white and Asian men feel their instructor does that makes them feel they belong and can succeed. And that might not be the same as what women feel or, or what our students of color, right? What, what their instructor does that makes them feel they can belong or can succeed. So we, uh, we were very intentional about stratifying our focus groups. Uh, we did six focus groups. Two of them were white and Asian men. Two of them were women only. Two of them were students of color only. Um, and this, oh yeah, that's just the, the question that we ask all of these focus groups. And I wanna share with you um, the variation that we got in the responses to that question um, from our focus groups. So we go to our focus groups, we, we list all of the things that people say, um, all, all the things the students say, my instructor does this, my instructor does that. Uh, and then we did a sort of thematic analysis of all the things that, that they reported. 
And what you're seeing here are the four most frequent themes. Okay, so the, the most frequent two themes where my instructor does this, that, that sort of promotes a growth mindset, or they have very good in, interpersonal skills. My instructor is one on, you know, good with one-on-one -on -one interactions, or actually not good with interactions was, was one of them, the negative version. Um, you know, my instructor engages all students, not just the kids in the front row or something. So these were the most frequent themes that came up. Um, but what you see, right, is there's, there's huge differences between what the white and Asian men were reporting and what the women and the students of color were reporting. In fact, the white and Asian men, the most frequent theme just for that uh, demographic, for those two focus groups, was always related to performance. I feel I belong when I'm getting a good grade. I feel I can succeed when I'm succeeding, according to grades, right? It was very much tied to uh, performance. That was the most frequent theme. The second most frequent theme or frequently said thing amongst white and Asian men, and this was explicit, there's nothing my instructor does that makes me feel I belong or can succeed. And that was, it was sort of the other side of the coin to the grades thing, right? For so many of them, um, their instructor, at least according to their reports, I'm not sure I believe all of them, but according to their reports, uh, really what mattered to them in terms of belonging and success was their performance and their instructor had very little to do with it. So if our focus groups had been, you know, 75% white and Asian men, uh, our data would have looked uh, very, very different than it did given our, our intentional stratification. Okay, anyway, step two, um, right? That was to take all of the behaviors that were reported, slap them into a huge survey. Uh, we did that last year. We distributed it to about 870 STEM students, mostly here at Penn State. Um, we were very intentional again in oversampling women. We wanted to make sure uh, that women and students of color were well represented in our sample. At Penn State, it is possible to get 63% uh, women. We had to work very hard, actually, to get 21% students of color. We are not a diverse campus, so that was a very difficult thing for us to do, and that will remain a limitation of this work. Um, it probably would have been better if we were gathering those data from, from a more diverse campus. Um, but in any case, we did what we could. And then we did our exploratory factor analyses and our item reduction. And what we have right now is a 28 item measure that has six factors. And we are still, I mostly, difficult for a black and white theoretical mathematician to do. And I, I don't mean that, I mean that very sincerely. Uh, interpreting things causes me a lot of stress and grief because I don't know how to do it. I like things that are black and white, like a theorem. It's true or it's false. And that just doesn't happen in this world. And it's hard on me, but whatever. Woe is me, right? Poor guy. Anyway, we're not quite sure about the interpretations, but let me show you what we have at this point. Uh, factor one, we're calling helpful. Um, you might see a couple of the item sample items in this factor. My instructor explains things in different ways, or my instructor makes sure all questions get answered before moving on. Factor two is group work. My instructor encourages us to work in groups. My instructor checks in on us when we work in groups. The third factor is engaging versus disinterested. So for instance, my instructor talks enthusiastically about math. My instructor has little or no interest in student success. Fourth factor, uh, actually, this one seemed very impactful, um, came up in a couple different focus groups, and, and probably you guys have heard something like this yourselves from other students. You know, my calculus teacher is so brilliant. I'm sure they're amazing with graduate students, but they're just too advanced to be teaching this course. Um, I don't quite know what to make of that one. Uh, I just feel like that is a really important one, and my gut feeling is that there's more to understand there, but I don't, at this point, we, we just have that as an item. My, my instructor is too advanced to be teaching this course. That was the direct report of the students. Another item in this factor is my, my instructor teaches too fast. Anyway, fifth factor, attention time management. My instructor pays more attention to some students than others. My instructor takes too long to return uh, our stuff. And the final 
factor, uh, which actually had a ton of items. Poor interpersonal skills. So for instance, my instructor smirks or laughs at our questions. My instructor says this material is simple, easy, or obvious. Um, so these are our, our four factors, a couple of samples. Um, and as I say, we are at the stage now of collecting data for confirmatory factor analyses and validity studies. So um, hopefully that work will go well. Hopefully we actually confirm the factor structure <laughs> instead of uh, the other. Um, and if that does go well, then I hope this measure will be ready for research and formative feedback. If, if individual instructors would like to get some formative feedback um, this fall, I, I will say I will be very disappointed if this measure is used for assessment of teaching in any way. I'm, I'm sure it's going to reflect the same sort of gender and racial bias that we see in teacher evaluations of other types. So I, I absolutely hope this is never used for uh, evaluation of teaching, but I do hope it will be a useful tool for research projects um, and for formative feedback so that we can get a sense of how our students are experiencing our classrooms. So specifically, um, there's a number of research questions that are sort of on the horizon or in the future, and I would be very happy uh, to get some help with any of these if anybody is interested. Um, We've developed this in the context of mathematics, uh, but if you look, actually, let me go back real quick. If you look here, like there's four items and I think I'm right. Yeah, none of those have anything to do with math, right? You could ask those questions in a chemistry class. You could ask those questions in a physics class without changing them at all. There are a couple where you might have to tweak a little bit, um, but mostly this measure isn't math specific even though it was developed there. Um, so one of the research questions that I'd be very curious about, you know, is it valid in physics, in biology, in other disciplines? Can you um, find associations with student level variables, psychosocial variables? Can you find associations with student level academic outcomes? Um, is there variation? I mean, I absolutely expect that there is, but is there variation across students' identity markers? Um, cause I don't believe, well, there's plenty of evidence that shows that women and men are not experience our classes the same way, right? Students of color and, um, uh, uh, white students are not experiencing the class the same way. So I would expect variation according to, uh, various identity markers, including, and what it is specifically when you take an intersectional perspective, I think we'll, we'll again see great variation, but another direction of research that I'm very curious about is how the students who are filling out this instructor behavior variable, like how, how or survey rather, how is that associated to instructor variables like the instructor's mindset? Or how about their discipline, right? Are averages like in math contexts and biology classes, are they the same? Uh, I'd be surprised to be honest. I would absolutely expect that if you were to do large scale studies and let students in a bunch of calculus classes and students in a bunch of biology classes fill out uh, instructor and in inclusive instructor behavior uh, surveys, I would guess we wouldn't expect the same averages uh, according to discipline, but I don't know that. So that's a, that's a question I would be very interested in hearing uh, to, in studying. So these are some research questions. Um, and I just want to leave, I want to end this with a, a sort of thought and a question for everyone. So as I say, I, I don't know how to interpret the studies that we saw at the beginning in any other way, you know, other than STEM head, STEM ed, higher STEM ed um, is structurally racist and sexist. We are operating in an equitable uh, ecosystem. And so my question is, how do we, people doing, you know, deeper work, how, how do we make sure that our work is dismantling those inequities as opposed to exacerbating them? And I really do mean that as a question, because um, I certainly don't have the answer to it. Um, so yeah, I would be very happy to get feedback, um, or if, I don't know. I hope everybody uh, will, will 
help me become a better researcher this way and, and maybe even think a little bit more deeply, a little more critically about your own work if you're not already uh, at this party. Um, because I think, you know, we could all agree that uh, it would just be terrible if our work was actually exacerbating inequities um, without our without our knowledge. Um, because just like with, you know, manslaughter and murder, our intentions are really irrelevant, right? What matters is is what's happening in our classes, what's happening with our work. And so I hope uh, we can all try to think about this question. How do we make sure that our research is shrinking equity gaps, not making them uh, bigger? So with that, I will close and thank you all very much for your time. Uh, it's been wonderful. So thank y'all. Thank you. Um, well, I think we have a few minutes for questions, right? Um, so if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or uh, jump in. And thank you, uh, Nate. That was really wonderful. Thank you. I saw all the hands up. Um, I think those are good. Oh, they're really happy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can ask one to, to get us to, or Sam, if you unmuted yourself. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Lead, great. I really like what you said there. And just two weeks ago, I attended the ONR uh, uh, URM student education uh, project as national wise project. And about five uh, ONR program officers were there with 13, 13 institutions from the country. And actually, I presented your Lexus paper, 2000, last year's paper, uh, in that uh, workshop. And so what we concluded one thing is that, or a couple of things, one is said that we may not be a racist, but we are, many of us are protecting a racist system. So that's one conclusion. A lot of the, uh, one language said, a lot of one says that actually CSU St. Marcos here, you said that they have uh, they are ranked number one in social morbidity. That means that that's the term I learned from there is that actually students can go from one class to the next class rather than to keep it rigid. This is very relevant to your kind of open-minded, growth-minded to the mindset. And a third sentence I learned is that I cannot be if I cannot see. So that means you, the, those are from, uh, there's will be the, the so set up examples for minority students. That's respond to your mind, uh, to your sense of belongings. So thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Nate. Great talk, by the way. Love it. Um, and the, the gentleman who just spoke, Sam Shen, is our former department chair in mathematics. He's a research mathematician. So I'm glad to see uh, you here, Sam. Thanks. Um, so I guess it was maybe seven or eight years ago, Francis Sue has an article on mathematical microaggressions. And I feel like your, your last category, your factor on um, interpersonal, I forget, interpersonal, that, whatever the term was, right? Maybe lends itself to mathematical microaggressions. And I was wondering if you thought about ways in which those do have a mathematical specific thing. So I'm thinking about in mathematics, oh, this is obvious. It probably doesn't happen in chemistry very often. And so I just want to hear your thoughts about maybe, maybe that, that factor does have some mathematical aspects to it. And that's that's a very good point. Um, that's a very good point. And so the the question about whether this measure is valid in other disciplines is a genuine question um, because it could be that that factor just doesn't show up when you if you were to distribute the, the measure as we have it today if you went to a chemistry class or biology class it very well could be that 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 factor just doesn't show up because that might be specific to mathematics um, I guess the thing I was I was trying to emphasize was that the wording of the questions for most of them doesn't uh, isn't math specific. It could be that the content of the questions is math specific, but the wording isn't. Uh, so there's yeah. no. I don't think. I don't think it's a heavy lift to adapt mm -hmm. this to a chemistry class or a, or a biology class or something. But you're yeah. you're absolutely right. I actually wasn't aware of that paper of 
Francis Sue, I'll have to look that up. Mathematical microaggressions, huh? Yeah, I think it's in the focus, maybe 2014, 2015. Probably Sandra knows off the top of her head. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll find it. That's that's yeah. terrific. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Colin, Colin has a question in the chat. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I will read uh, what Colin wrote. Says a bit loud in my apartment right now. Neil is playing the drums, so I'll type mine out. A comment. I really enjoyed your sh your shared how you shared your journey towards using critical theory in education research. It was very genuine and demonstrates your passion for equitable experiences for your students. I think it is also a great model for other instructors and researchers as they may see a part of themselves within your story. You could very well inspire other mathematicians to grow and learn in the same ways that you have with a smiley face emoji. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Colin. I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I certainly hope you're right about that. I mean, I think it's important for all of us to normalize our imperfections because um, I don't know anybody who's perfect. And so being vulnerable and being able to stand up and say, yeah, I sure wish I would have done that differently. I hope that makes it a little uh, easier for other people to um, to make some changes because we're all we're all on a journey. We're all on a path towards whatever enlightenment means to you. Um, and so, yeah, I appreciate that. And I hope you're right. Thank you. If nobody asks, I will ask. If other, if other people ask, I, I, I will stop. Yes, okay. So and now we, uh, I, I mean, just say, I probably say we just, uh, yes, I read a lot of papers on education and uh, you know, chronicle higher, uh, higher education. I read several of yours. And you know, we talk a lot about problems and I'm more into looking for solutions. So what I've been doing, I, I want you know, we, I want to introduce, uh, oh, that's what I'm doing now, the kind of progressive education pedagogy to mathematics and science. How do you think about that method, progressive education pedagogy? I am unfamiliar with it. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to learn. If you have a resource or something you could send me, I'd love to learn more about it. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't answer your question, <laughs> but that's that's the best I can say. Um, as I say, I, I am not yet an education expert. Um, I am very much in the process of learning this. So I appreciate you bringing that to my, uh, into my realm so I can learn something. I will email you. We have a, we'll, we'll have a discussion. I, I read Terrific. some pages. Yeah. Terrific. Thank Sandra, you very much. Sandra, also unmuted. Sandra, do you want to jump in? Sure. Thanks for the talk, Nate. Um, Sandra Larson at Colorado Boulder. I, 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 this is not a well-formed question, but one reaction I have a little bit to your six factors is it's a fairly low bar, and that's maybe connected to your pragmatic goals, but it makes me a little sad to think a lot of students don't even see a faculty member who's excited about their discipline or who answers their questions or pays attention to them. And so could you comment on that? Like, do you think this will really, I don't know, how would you like to see this change the behavior? Um, so that's a hard question. Um, that's a hard question, but let me, so let me address the first bit of it and then I'll come back to how, how I hope it will be used and make some changes. Um, one of the limitations of this work is that it was done at Penn State in our calculus classes, which are small, relatively small, 45, 50 students, not 100 student um, you know, lecture halls. So we have a lot of faculty uh, teaching this, but relatively few, almost none actually in the calculus sequence are using anything other than traditional sage on the stage lecture. So the sample, the students that you know reported to us, they weren't seeing progressive teaching methods at all. Uh, they're really just reporting what happens in a traditional monologue lecture, um, and that's a limitation. So um, it would be very interesting to redo this whole project with a greater variety of student, uh, a greater variety of class 
uh, teaching methodologies and so on, um, because I would guess that the the items we get would be very different, and hopefully, the bar would be raised a little bit um, if if we were to do that. So there's that, and then the other point is that I I really become quite a I don't know obsessed maybe is a little strong, but <laughs> really think a lot about emotions and psychology, and it's it's so funny because I my whole career like first half of my career I was 100% on board with the idea that real learning deep learning difficult learning required that you push all your emotions to the side get them out of the way like you can't learn anything if your brain is confused with it like that's how I felt and now I know I was exactly wrong about all of that um, and now neuroscientists have actually shown that emotion is a key ingredient to deep um, learning and understanding and knowledge. Um, so anyway, that's just to say that I personally hope that the measure that we develop, if nothing else, it will just raise awareness and lead to better training of our graduate students, of our faculty around emotional psychological components of teaching because I'm a research mathematician, and I can assure you when I was a grad student and all my colleagues that I interacted with at, at conferences and so on, we all genuinely believe that good math instruction is all about the math, nothing else, right? It's just about the math. Emotions have nothing to do with it. How I interact with you has nothing to do with it. If I dismiss your question, that shouldn't bother you. It's just about the math. And if we could get rid of that, uh, misguided if i that's the polite most polite way <laughs> I could put it, that misguided philosophy uh i would be thrilled um and i hope that this work will sort of contribute to that thanks great well, i see that colin had put a link into the focus article thanks colin that was quick work of you so if you want if anyone wants to go to the, the chat you can find francis sue's article on mathematical migrations. Uh, please join me again in thanking Nate. Great to have a virtual talk. Thanks, wish you could have been here, but uh, this is the next best thing. Thanks so much, Nate. Thank you. And again, it was a pleasure. I hope to meet you all in person someday soon. Yeah, please please come visit us and uh, I can leave the room open, but let's make sure folks have to move on. They can uh, have a good place to go. So have a good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> all right, thank you. See you, Colin's child. Yeah, <laughs> I will call it. Have a great day, all. Okay, bye bye.